Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, October 29, 2015, and this is the Week in Charts. This week's Week in Charts is brought to you by WebinarSoon.com. There's Webinar Soon. <laughs> Here's the disclaimer screen. As you know, if you've been trading for more than a day, you can lose money trading, or as I like to sum it up, all predictions are about the future, and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then so what are we going to talk about well as usual i like to just talk about it instead of talk about talk about it but uh is it all clear in the western front is everything just fine markets trying to push back to new highs at least the s p and the nasdaq is and is this going to be the all clear and we'll take a look at that um i also think the market is a very bad teacher and that'll work until it don't that'll all make sense in just a few minutes uh by the way I don't have a tremendous amount to cover this week, so if, you, if there's something you guys want me to cover while we're on the slides, feel free to let me know. And then um, just hold off on your stock selection so I can get to the questions first. But once we get to the charts, just ask about one stock at a time so I can answer your question and then uh, delete that question. And then uh, feel free to ask about as many as you want. But just ask it one, about one at a time. All right. Um, let's just get into it here. I got this, Jim, over the week. You have been pounding the table the past month saying that the market is in a lot of trouble. Have you ever thought about picking another line of work? <laughs> well, first of all, anybody who's been trading for a while, you know that there are times when you print money and you feel like God. And then there's other times where, yeah, maybe you think about maybe you should be flipping burgers or something and you wonder if you even qualify for that. That's just normal ups and downs. Um and, you know, here's the thing. If I was always right, you'd never see my fat ass again. Uh, can I do a brief intro? You mean on who I am or or what's the um... – oh, okay. Um, Dave Landry from DaveLandry.com. Uh, I've been at this for a while. You can get a bio off my website. Uh, I've been trading for 20-something years. I uh, was a commodity trading advisor for about 15 years, I think. Um, registered. I'm no longer registered as an advisor. Um, but yeah, see my website, DaveLander.com, for a complete bio on me. I've written three books that are in about, uh, I don't know, half a dozen languages at least. Um, and I'm going to go visit some of those countries really soon. Anyway, um, you know, if I was always right, you'd never see my fat ass again. And then here's the thing you always have to ask yourself when trading. If you're given the same information again, would you do the same thing? Oh, by the way, I'm a, mostly a stock trader, but I will trade other markets such as Forex. I think that you're better off trading inefficient markets such as smaller cap stocks, IPOs, and stocks like that. Uh, there are cases, though, where you can trade more efficient markets like Forex, uh, and, and that's usually with like, like a transitional pattern. I believe you can only predict the short term, but you can stick around longer term if the position moves in your favor through proper money and position management by taking partial profits and trailing your stops higher. I have 1,400 YouTube videos, so um, feel free to check those out as your time allows, okay? Yes, uh, the question is, are you the same one that's going to have a workshop in Hong Kong? Uh, yes, Bobby, I am, and I uh, would love to see you there. So you always have to ask yourself, when you're following a methodology is, well, first of all, are you following the methodology? And you have to follow some methodology. Now, this is, I'm getting a little ahead of myself already, but I have people that have emailed me for five, 10, and I think as some that's even 15 years, and they're still searching. They're still out there looking for the Holy Grail, and they're like, hey, Dave, what do you think about this? And some of these people have been around so long, and, and I actually know that they have some trading related business going on and it makes me wonder what are they actually doing if they're still looking so hard that doesn't mean you can't learn new things and try new things but there seems to be this searching and this perpetually out of phase because they'll trade mean reversion for a while and they'll be quite successful but then all of a sudden the market begins to trend and then they get they either blow up or close to coming blowing up blowing up then they go to trend trading, but by the time they get to trend trading, the market starts mean reverting again. And again, they end up in this perpetual cycle. So I think you have to pick one thing and just do it well and follow that system. So that's the system. You know, what's the best system? The system that you're going to follow, provided it's a viable system and conceptually it makes a lot of sense. 
Now, the question is, are we out of the woods yet or back into the woods? I don't know how you would say that with the bear. Uh, part two, okay, part two here. Um, and, and the answer is, I don't know. I, I wouldn't start kissing each other just yet. And let's take a look at the market here. This is the S&P 500, obviously. Now, notice that we've had a nice longer term uptrend uh, all the way back pretty much since 2009. This is a weekly chart, by the way. And to those who are new to the presentation, I know we have some new faces here. So this is a 10-day a simple moving average. You got you older guys or guys have been around, just bear with me and girls. This is a 20-day exponential, a 20 EMA. And this is a – actually, I have, them, I have them backwards. 10 days simple, 20-day exponential, 30-day exponential. What I have observed is that when they come together over a short period of time – and by the way, this works at all time frames, five-minute time frames, one-minute time frames – Weekly time frames. I prefer daily, but when you get the weekly signals, it's a pretty powerful signal. When they come together for a short period of time, it suggests that the trend has turned. And you can see here that the market has lost steam here and it has begun to roll over. And then your setup is once the market pulls back. So you get the bow tied, you get the pullback, and the trigger would have been here. So this was a trigger. When this occurs after all-time highs, it usually pays to pay attention. But so far, what's happened? The market has kind of faked out, and so far, it's headed higher. Now, we're going to talk about fake outs here in just one second. Now, the last couple of times we had sell signals was off of major highs, or all-time highs, I should say, was in 2000, and then also in 2008. And it was very early 2008. In fact, the bow tie formed in 2007, believe it or not. And then the actual trigger, I think, was in early 2008. Now, the market lost about 50% of its value here, and uh, memory serves about 40% back here. So both were very substantial bear markets. And what followed was kind of interesting, this 02, 03 bottom. It took a while to bottom out, but eventually we did get a bow tie sell signal. This was a sell signal. I'm sorry, a buy signal here. And in 2009, it was a little late, although we did have a lot of daily signals in March of 2009. I'm sorry, March or April 2009, I forget. I have to go back and look at the daily. But it was right around that time. And then the weekly took a little while to catch up. Remember, you're going to have some lag in the moving average. Okay. Uh, but what's amazing is sometimes the moving average can uh, predict – I shouldn't say predict. I should say sort of uh, – illustrate that the market is rolling over and without a whole lot of lag. Uh, we'll get to that question there, Bobby. Just hang on one second. So we did have the buy signal 2009. It was a little late to the game, but the market more than doubled since, so better than a poke in the eye from that signal. Now, a major signal comes off of multi-year lows, let's say 10-year lows, or in this case, I think that was like a 15-year low, or all-time highs. And the same thing holds true for any other market like Forex, Gold, uh, crude, crude oil right now could be making those major, major lows in here. So it pays to pay attention, even in efficient markets like the S&P 500. Earlier when I was explaining to Bobby a uh, little bit about who I am, I said I like to trade inefficient markets. So inefficient market would be something like an IPO or a smaller cap stock where everything isn't all factored in. And the stock can make large price moves. Whereas if you're trading a big, thick, meaning high volume stock, most of that stuff is already factored in. In fact, I actually like, at some cases, in some specific cases, I actually like to short those stocks. And I've got a strategy you can look at on my website. It's on it's under free reports called the GoGo Nomo. So download that if you get a chance. And that just means that the momentum has ended for these uh these go go stocks because they're priced for perfection. So that is a case where you could trade efficient markets. Now, the reason I'm talking about efficient markets is because the S&P 500 is obviously an efficient market. There's a lot of a uh, lot of trading. It's well watched. It's overanalyzed. So, but it can make significant moves when you have these transitional patterns, such as a bow tie or a first thrust off of major major highs off or off of major major lows. So, it's a signal. And as I'm going to say in just one second, that should be taken seriously. Okay, so you need to take them seriously uh, as if it would be the big one. Now, I'm often quoting Greg Morris. I'm, a good, I'm good friends with Greg. 
Um, he's been around for a long time. He's traded, I think, uh, possibly at the peak. I want to say he was close to seven billion in the fund, but I think five billion is probably a safe estimate of um, of funds under management. And he just recently retired uh, this year, actually. Ed, I like what he wrote in investing with the trend, and he's he's uh, also said when he when he gives a presentation. He takes, uh, he tr they treat all signals as if it will be the big one. They treat all signals seriously. So this is why, as the aforementioned gentleman said, I was pounding, been pounding the table. And I wouldn't say pounding the table so much as just saying that, hey, this is what I'm seeing. Last couple times this happened, the market went down 50%. Does this mean the market's going to go down 50%? No, of course not, okay? But you need to take signals seriously. Again, not to beat the dead horse on that. Okay, so am I wrong? I might be, but I have no regrets. And that's the secret to trading, if there is a secret, right? The day you start second guessing your signals is the day that you're dead because you'll never take another signal or you'll start sharpshooting your signals. And that means that you're gonna end up taking the bad signals, but unfortunately you're gonna miss out on the good signals. Um, as we say in the South, the sun doesn't shine, the same dog's ass every day. The buy and hope crowd has been rewarded since 2009 because every time the market sells off, it comes right back, okay? Now there's a new crop that comes along every few years. Those poor saps that, that held on from 2007 on, even though there were some serious signals they got absolutely cream they lost half their money at least in 2008 now it did come back obviously since 2009 so and that's i'm glad i'm glad it came back okay but you have to take everything seriously that market could have stayed down for a long long time and unfortunately some of these people may have been forced to to get out OK, so so much for buy and hold because they needed money to live. And like Greg pointed out, say you save a million dollars for retirement and then you, the market drops like it did in 2009, 2008, early 2009. You know, you're left with half the amount of money. So a that makes a, a, a difference in your lifestyle in, 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 because you just follow it down. So I think you have to take signals seriously um if you are following a methodology you may lose the battle or battles obviously but not the war okay longer term you're going to do just fine shorter term you might have to take some lumps here and there you should sell first and that doesn't mean exit at the first sign of adversity i often preach you will have to take some heat on almost every trade very rarely especially in more recent times maybe in 1999 it was a different story when the market just was going straight up. But very rarely does the market only move in your favor. There's going to be a lot of zigs and a lot of zags, and you have to be willing to give up some open profits. By the way, I say this quite often. I'll say it again. I have, quote, unquote, fixed a lot of people, quote, fixed, unquote, fixed, a lot of people who were unsuccessful simply by saying loosen your stops your stops are too tight you loosen up your stops a little bit give the markets a little room to breathe and lo and behold you'll start catching more trends now if you're still getting stopped out as i also often preach maybe your stock selection or market selection is not up to par maybe you need a little bit more experience in that and of course not to soft sell but i do have a stock selection course out there maybe i'll talk a little bit about that in one second and uh, offer a, a deal now the market can be a little perverse, and the market, uh, Lin, I got this from Linda Rasky, and I asked her where she got it, and she said, oh, I don't know, I don't remember saying that, but I probably got it off the floor, and she calls them floorism, so I, I respect any trader who has spent time on the floor, because like Linda said, uh, she was on the floor, you look to your left, you look to your right, and you wait a couple of months, and whoever's still there is who you need to glom on to to learn from and that's what she told me she did to become successful as a floor trader but anyway she said uh, in one presentation that i was watching a while back she said the market will do uh, what it has to do to frustrate the most people 
And then she went on to say it will also do what it has to do to cause the most pain. And once we look at the charts, that's going to make a little bit more sense. Um, in general, it's a bad teacher. Have you ever decided to honor your stop and the market stops you out? And then, of course, it turns right around and goes straight back up. Well, if if you have it, trust me, that experience will happen to you. It happened to me yesterday. I just fired off a little day trade in Forex. I got uh, ticked off literally and physically uh, while I was at lunch. I, would, I decided to take my bride out for lunch. And when I got back, I was like, oh, wow, market moved in my favor. And then I realized, wait a minute, it looks like I got stopped out to the, to the tick or to the pip, however you want to look at it. So it happens, and it's spelled with a silent S-H. But let's say that you don't honor that stop. Well, the market tells you, don't use stops, okay? It, there's even stupid people out there telling you don't use stops. Well, that'll work until it don't because eventually the market's going to blow through where that stop should be. It's going to keep on going. It's not going to reverse. So sometimes you just have to take your lumps, lick your wounds, and then move on. Now, keeping a level head and following your methodology is key. And it doesn't have to be my methodology. That's the thing. You know, we get these um, these a-holes every now and then come to these <laughs> webinars and start beating me up. It's like, hey, I, I never said it was my way or the highway. I just have a very simple approach. And trust me, I tried everything, okay? Nearly, or I should say nearly everything that you can imagine. I counted bars. I counted waves. Uh, and it did all these other things, okay? I actually do have one little Fibonacci pattern, but I don't actually measure. I just kind of eyeball it, but I don't want to digress too far. But trust me, I tried everything. And I often do a speech where I talk about the trader's journey, where you just take a, a simple chart when you start out, because that's how your charts come, usually at least with the most charting packages. And you start adding stuff to it. And before you know it, you can no longer see the chart. And I used to create indicators on indicators, derivatives of derivatives of derivatives. And then one day I just realized, hey, you know, let's just let's just see what the price is actually doing. Because when you make a trade, you're not agreeing on the stochastic or the wave count or the price earnings ratio or whatever you want to throw in there. You're agreeing on the price of the stock. OK, if you're buying it, someone has agreed to sell it to you and you have agreed to buy it. You're not agreeing on all those other factors. So, primum non non cherry. I don't, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that exactly right. It's a Latin. I don't know if it sounds more like Italian or whatever. But in English, that means first do no harm. So, when I'm writing my column or doing the market in a minute and in my trading service, obviously, I want to make money. I want to look smart. And I want to give the best advice or I should say education because it's not construed as advice, right, technically. But I want to put out the best, let's just call it information. I want to put out the best information I can, but I also want to do no harm. Now, it's not just that I'm going to couch and be careful. I also want to do no harm to myself too, okay? You could make money in markets doing stupid things, and I have, okay? That My career was was partially launched because I did some stupid things. I was over leveraged and should not have been taking these trades, but they worked out, okay? And that kind of kept me afloat long enough to, to start figuring things out. But again, the market's a bad teacher. I could have just as easily uh, blown up in the process. So, but first of all, you want to, you want to protect your capital the best you can before putting that capital in harm's way. Now, I just said, like I just said, you will have to be willing to give up some of that capital in the form of open losses or open losses to open profits. And occasionally, you'll get stopped out in positions and take some losses. It all comes with the territory. We get paid to put money into harm's way. It's something you got to wrap your head up around. You have to see each trade as an expense. Now, I still drop F-bombs. I'm still human, okay? And I still get pissed off. I dropped one just yesterday, okay? And then every time I do it, I catch myself saying, well, why are you doing that? Just calm down. You're going to be fine. Longer term, you're just frustrated at this one particular situation. 
So you have to keep that level head. You have to follow your methodology, both good and bad. And you want to make sure you have the best setups going in to a position and first do no harm. So me saying the market could be in trouble in here, I don't think that is a bad thing to say. Me saying to be cautious in here, I don't think that's a bad thing to say. And as I've said quite a bit, down when we were back when we were down towards the lows in October or August or whenever you want to see it, uh, however you want to look at it, people were asking me, Dave, when would you be bullish again? It's like, well, this market would actually have to go on to make new highs, actually physically make new highs and not only make new highs, but stay there before I would become, quote unquote, bullish. Anything less than that, I would be concerned. Now, you have to remember Good questions coming out. I'll get right to them. I promise. Good, uh, good things. Uh, one thing to remember here is, first of all, you have this overhead supply, or some people call it overhead resistance. Now, traders usually don't agree for long, but in this area, you can see we had all this trading. There's nothing magical about these little bars. There are a bunch of little people who likely have bought the market during this period. Now, when the market begins to implode, obviously they're not happy. OK. Now, sometimes if this happens quickly, it comes right back up. They don't have time to react. In fact, as a general statement, most people as a general statement, most people are very slow to react when it comes to markets. Not everybody's a trader like you guys and girls in here. The masses are very slow to react. And if the market comes right back, they sometimes they even they even miss the sell off. Oh, it was a sell off. Oh, I didn't even notice. Now, so far, this market has really faked out. We had the thrust down, a little pullback, and it looked like it was getting ready to head lower. But what happened? It promptly turned around. Now, some people are arguing, well, the Fed's stepping on the gas again and everything. And I try not to confuse the issue with facts, but I hear you. And yes, don't fight the Fed. But the way you don't fight the Fed is you don't fight the tape. So if the tape is going higher, it doesn't matter if it's because of the Fed or why. The whys do not matter. We could talk about the whys after the fact. But what you have to do is follow that price in the meantime. So, yeah, if we go on to make new highs, I'll start getting bullish again. But the reason I made this little graphic today is anybody who didn't sell when we had this sell-off is quickly becoming happy now that they're getting back to – break even and that's the whole theory behind overhead supply there's nothing magical about my form of technical analysis people would just look to get out likely at break even when a market drops below where they bought it's just human nature they want to get off the hook i was at a cocktail party a few weeks back and we got to talking about energy because one of the uh one of the gentlemen there is in an energy related business and he says he owns a bunch of energy stocks and he's going to sell them all as soon as he gets back to break even. So it's just human nature. And I told him, I said, that's not a strategy. That's a that's a bad idea. If, they, if they're going up, just let them keep going up. You know, maybe take some profits along the way or maybe lighten up a little bit if you feel like you made a mistake in the original trade. But don't get out at break even. That's not a strategy. It's not a winning strategy. But it's human nature. Now, the reason, again, or I should say to, to elaborate on why I drew this graphic like I did, is a market is going to do what it has to do to cause the most pain. So right now, this nice little rally we've had in here all the way into this resistance is making people think, hey, it's all clear. Everything's cool. We have nothing to worry about. If the market begins to roll over from here, anyone who's left will begin second second guessing their decision not to exit as we approach the resistance okay so i think we had a very interesting juncture here and i'm pretty amazed that this market is just going straight back up and again i won't get too excited until we get to new highs get up in clear air and stay there for a while and then at that point this becomes actual support for the market okay so if we begin to roll over in here i think a lot of people are going to be unhappy and i think it's going to get ugly really fast but you know the routine one day at a time don't make any big picture predictions but dave i thought you were predicting a bear market i didn't say we were going to have a bear market i said that it looked like a bear market could be developing okay 
if you label yourself a bull or a bear, I think you can get yourself in a lot of trouble. Don't be a bull. Don't be a bear. Just be aware. As many people say, hedge fund uh, I used to work with, uh, the manager told me once, he says, well, the thing about you, Dave, is right or wrong, I always know where you stand. I had a guy before you came in, he could never make a decision. And as I wrote a column a while back, I'm often wrong, but I'm never in doubt. And I think that's important. I think that's the way you have to be in markets, okay? Now, of course, you have to have a stop <laughs> because you know you're often wrong, right? But you have to be confident in what you're doing. And again, it doesn't, you don't have to be doing, you don't have to be doing, it, it doesn't have to be what I'm doing, okay? You don't have to do my methodology or use my methodology. Just in your own methodology, just be confident in it. And, and you become confident through, through your own success and through your years and years of experience and hard work, okay? I got an email this morning, uh, you know, make $10 million in 10 minutes. And it's like, my blood begins to boil. I wasn't going to talk about this today. I said, oh, Dave, don't talk about that. It's kind of one of those things like, uh, you know, don't think about elephants. But it's like my blood begins to boil. You know, if it was that easy, then <laughs> why would you even why would you even be trying to, uh, I, I don't know, why would you just quit, you know, or just maybe work more than 10 minutes a day and then make $20 million, you know. <laughs> I don't know. But I don't want to digress too far on that, okay. All right, so a lot of questions. Let me get let me get some questions taken care of before we finish up on the slides. All right, fantastic. Uh, active bunch today. Glad to see the questions come in. All right, first of all, let's go back to Tom. Tom's been waiting patiently. Tom says, "We're close to all-time highs. However, only 62. We are close to all-time highs. However, only 62% of all stocks on the NYSE." or above their respective 200-day moving average. Most stocks are not out of the woods yet. Yeah, Tom, I agree with that. And it's amazing how many people I've seen so far who are already bullish. And, and <laughs> it's like, let's like start kissing each other just yet. Let's let this market prove itself. And, and what's amazing is we still have these debacle du jours out there. It seems like... Uh, each day a new, not necessarily not necessarily a big sector, but it seems like each day a new little subsector gets hit, and that's concerning. Dave, what the hell happened to all that six to eight months of overhead resistance in the S and P five hundred? It's not working, damn it. <laughs> well, yeah, you know, and that's and that's again the market's a bad teacher. It, it usually the market should have some issues when it hits that resistance. But the market do whatever it wants. I mean, what's the story about the the kid that was going to teach the floor trader um, how to how to sit behind a desk and come off the floor because he was getting too old to be on the floor? And he's in, um, you know, the kid's like, this is, this is support. The market will stop here at support. And the guy's like, really? And so he picks up the phone and says, hey, what would it take to, uh, to hit, get some new lows in soybeans? And the guy says, I don't know, $5 million. And, and the trader says, all right, at the market. So all of a sudden, bam, he hit the market hard, and the market began imploding. And then guess what? There was a bit of a stampede, and so I being headed lower, okay? <laughs> so a market can do whatever it wants. And then, like, as Douglas, the late, great Mark Douglas once said, all it takes is one A-hole to screw up your trade. I mean, here's a guy screwing around <laughs> to make a point, and he, and he moved the whole market. So a market could do whatever it wants, but you have to have a framework to work around. You have to have a methodology to work around. And for me, it's trend following, short to intermediate term, framed within classical technical analysis. So if I see overhead supply and then I see a bow tie or one of my other setups, like a first thrust setting up, then what do I do? Well, I follow my methodology. Right, wrong, okay? Right or wrong, but never in doubt. And I think that's a true enlightenment when you start following your system and do the right thing. All right, some of these questions are out of context. So let me let me uh, clean up a few. All right, Bobby says, does Fed raising rates in December would affect S&P market? I know dollar will be stronger till year end. Okay, well, we don't know that the dollar will be stronger until year end, okay? We'll take a look at the dollar here in a few minutes. Uh We'll take a look at what the market does and decide whether or not the Fed 
moves or lack thereof mean anything. And that's why I just look at price and I try not to get too caught up in the news. My clients feel like they have to send me the news and and truth be told, I was checking Yahoo yesterday. There's some news coming out on one of the stocks we're in. And I'm actually worried about that, okay? I never worried about that in the past or would I even known, okay? Sometimes ignorance is bliss when it comes to markets. But if you start trying to trade around news and connect the dots and use that logic, you can get yourself into a lot of trouble really fast. All right, Greg says, I got a bad connection and can barely follow. Oh, I'm sorry, okay? Yeah, I'll put, uh, the question is, will I post this online? Yeah, absolutely. Um, as soon as I get through with the presentation, I'll click process. It'll take about an hour or so, and then I'll hit upload. So within two or three hours, it will be up on YouTube. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Straight up and straight down makes me uncomfortable. Well, it should, okay? Okay. You can tell the people who, Martin, you can, you can tell people like you who are actual traders and actually been there and are now just out searching for systems and being willy-nilly at, at, at having – not have a methodology yeah it's like the market goes straight down then also just goes straight back up you know Beatrice that's not how, that's not how it works that's not how any of this works okay but what do you do do you fight it no you just let it all unfold you let your short stop out if that's what happens okay and you stop putting on new ones provided you but Dave you got a short setup for today well yeah we got a setup it looks pretty good I think it's worth taking but as a general statement, we haven't done a whole lot of trading, and we haven't been triggered into a lot of trades, too. We've, we've had a lot of setups, but not a whole lot of triggers over the last three months. Now, before that, in spite of the market, we were fairly accurate uh, – well, accurate, and we're active. I meant to say active, but I said accurate. But we were fairly accurate. We had a pretty good year, 2015, up until recently. We hit a few bumps in the road, like I talked about last week. But go in and see last week's presentation – on why we took those setups in spite of the market. We took those setups because we liked them. Ideally, you want that market, you want the sector, and you want stocks within sectors um, all in your favor. Correction of opportunity, moving average. Okay. Try downtrending the documents. Try, try downloading documents, and it sent me to different ones than the ones it's supposed to send. Uh, what documents are you looking for? You're looking for the. Uh, Oh, you mean on the uh, free reports? Shoot me an email on that and I'll fix it. I've been having some issues uh, with some of these things. I need to clone myself. Phil says, on the floor to my left, the empty Jack Daniels and the right is a Mountain Dew. <laughs> oh, man. Only price pays. Amen, Howard. Good, uh, good point. Correcto below the 200-day. Do you consider having a seminar and only buying Phoenix stocks since you said some of your biggest winners have been Phoenix stocks? Um, that's a good question. Uh, Phoenix stock is is what I call it's uh, Dick Fruth, who um, I think he wrote uh, what's the name of the book? Parabolic. I have the book in my in my book bag. I have to grab it. I haven't I haven't I read the uh, most of the draft because I helped him write some of it. But uh, Dick talks about these stocks that go down and make these big long bases at bottoms. And these companies reinvent themselves. And, and um, he initially was going to put a bow tie chapter in there because the bow ties work pretty good with that. And what um, what Gary is asking is, uh, in the S&P, this chart right here is not a good example. Let me just put a blank chart up. What I call a Phoenix stock. And I talk about how that how some of your big, biggest winners can come from Phoenix stocks. So say a stock's way up here. And then it just downtrends for years and years or months and months or whatever. And then it bases. And let's say it bases for months and months and years and years and years and years and years. Well, during this phase, the stock kind of reinvents itself. A lot of this supply begins to work its way through the market. Unfortunately, people die. Unfortunately, or fortunately, people retire and need money. Um, and people die and the stock goes to an estate and the stock gets sold and the stake gets settled. A lot of stuff can happen between then and now okay and the company may get its act back together now we had a little solar stock that went up about 600 percent after it bottomed out and formed one of these phoenix patterns and the reason it probably did that was because their technology improved energy overall bottomed out 
the energy of the future. It seems like a lot of these energies of the future, it's, it's like a moving target. They're always the energy of the future, okay? So maybe they became a little bit more viable with their methodology, the, the cost of goods sold. I don't let my MBA rear its ugly head, but the cost of goods sold began to drop as the economies of scale kicked in and all these other things. So a company could kind of sort of reinvent itself, get its act together, and that supply could work its way through the system. So like a phoenix rising from the ashes, sometimes you can get some really great stocks, bottom out, and then make a little cup and handle, make a little bow tie. Bow tie is my pattern. Cup and handle, obviously, popularized by William O'Neill. Uh, cups have been around forever or been uh, have been discovered forever. You can read books on technical analysis written oh. 60, 70, 80 years ago. Schaubacher, I think, talks about cups. Uh, I know Edwards and McGee talked about cups. So all these classical technical analysis patterns begin to kick in, and then you get something like a setup, like a bow tie. And these could be really powerful type of stocks. And, and uh, Dick, like I said in his book, talks a lot about these type of stocks. Um, I think you could you could probably do pretty good if, if all you did was trade stocks like that. The energy stocks and the metals and mining, which we're going to look at in a few minutes, could be our next Phoenix stocks, okay? Um, unfortunately, you'd have to sit on your hands a lot, and you'd have to wait and wait and wait and wait and be the most extremely patient person in the world because these Phoenix stocks don't come along every day. And sometimes you have some fits and starts with these things. Sometimes it looks like they take it off. You get stopped out. Eh, so be it. They go back to make new lows, and they go back to the bottom being a process more an event. That's fine. OK, go after them when they set up again, because if that thing takes off and doubles and triples or quadruples in value, then getting beat up a few times with some losses is OK. Um, if you're more active as a trader, you can't just sit around and wait for Phoenix stocks. OK, uh, I think you could probably own, only trade IPO pullbacks and do fairly well. But a lot of times you wouldn't have any setups and a lot of times you wouldn't be sitting on your hands. So. You, you need it's kind of like you need something to do in the meantime and even stocks and, and existing trends sometimes can still make some very very significant moves and can be very worthwhile trading okay so it's not just necessarily these phoenix stocks that are the or the only stocks to trade but i think if that's all you did i think you would do quite fine so um I'll think about that. I, you know, maybe I need to do some smaller uh, seminars where instead of doing an eight-hour all-day seminar and then eight hours of follow-up on weekly basis uh, type of, uh, you know, these big massive packages that I put together, instead of doing that, maybe I need to do some little more of snippet types of things where I spend just a couple hours, we focus on one thing and, and doing that one thing well. And I think that would really help uh, people out tremendously. So I, I like what you're saying uh, on that. Um, email me. I'll put you on the. Uh, I'll make sure I comp you on that uh, if I do that. So you're uh, because it's a good idea. Um, although I have thought about the idea has crossed my mind of doing such things, but I appreciate the uh, your support on that. So uh, yeah, send me an email and say, hey, remember me. <laughs> uh, do you call it the Phoenix pattern because it's rising from the bottom? Yeah, yeah, I have. Um, Somewhere, um, if I could spell Phoenix, P H O E N I X. I actually draw the um, the Phoenix pattern on the charts, um, and this is just I just did a search on my computer, but yeah, I actually put the Phoenix because it's rising from the ashes, and you can see in this particular case, like th right here, the stock just kind of bottomed out and it's trying to rally from the ashes uh, in here. Okay, so that's what it, kind of a Phoenix type of pattern would look like. Thanks for the input on that, Gary. Appreciate it. If you think everyone will sell at break even, then why not sell at the market? Well, uh, we don't know that. Okay. Uh, if you're long, but why would you sell if you're if you're already long? Okay. And you have a stop in place and the market's going up. So if the market's going up, stay long. Okay. I'm going to teach you something here. If you're long and the market's going up, stay long. Remember the gentleman I talked about earlier? Oh, as soon as I get my money back, I'm getting out. Well, if the market's going up, why would you quit? Uh, you know, would you quit 
if a football team quits every time they hit the, hit the 50 yard line, they would never score a touchdown, right? Michael says, if you're using proper position sizing, stops, drives the calculations. Absolutely. And by that, he means you, your stop is based on the volatility of the underlying market. Okay. So if a stock is bouncing around three or four points a day, your stop needs to be outside of that range. If you try to use a one point stop and it's bouncing around three or four points a day, I could all but guarantee that you will get stopped on your position. Now, timing helps, but the nature of the beast, you got to think that this stock is bouncing around. It's not going to stop bouncing around just because you get in it, okay? Even if it does move in your favor, as I said earlier, it's not going to necessarily move in a straight line. That's almost one thing I can guarantee. So a lot of people say, Dave, your stops are too loose. You're using a 20% a twenty percent stop in this stock. Well, the stock bounces around 10 15% over several day period. If you're going to try to hold it for that short-term swing trade and hopefully have that turn into something longer term, then it might take that 20% or maybe even bigger stop. But what you do is you compensate by trading fewer shares. And if you do catch a big move in a stock like that, and that's why I wrote the article, why I trade in efficient stocks or why you should trade in efficient markets and stocks because it'll make that large inefficient move and you'll be rewarded tremendously. Now you're going to have a smaller position because of the nature of the beast. As I often say, it's better the devil that you know. Can you can't have a session without your thoughts of precious metals? <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I think I used to be a gold bug. I guess, I, I guess deep down I still am. Uh, it, it, those habits die hard. I'm kind of a biotech bug too, and those habits die hard. Um, I did a lot of gold stock trading early in my career, and I traded a lot of biotechs early in my career and kind of gotten uh, or fallen, I should say, in love with them. So I've got to be careful though, because sometimes it's got me, that can sort of uh, jade or, or, or affect my judgment when it comes to those. Okay, uh, Bruce, a very common question. Bruce says, do I use ATR stops? That's average true range. Um, I think if you if you boiled it all down, the answer to that question is probably yes, okay, or yes, flat out. But I don't actually plot the ATR on my screen. I kind of eyeball that, like I said earlier, the stock moving around four and five and six points a day or whatever it does, and then figure out where my stop will be. And if you go in and watch some of the YouTubes on that, I did, I did a few shows on the YouTubes and put YouTubes out there on that in some of these weekend charts where I talk about uh, setting that stop, okay, and and looking at things like where, number one, where would I be wrong, for instance, if you're trading that Phoenix pattern, if it goes on to make new lows, maybe that longer term downtrend remains intact. Uh, so ask yourself where you'd be wrong, where would you be outside of the normal volatility, and then all those other things I talk about in that thing. So uh, the quick answer is, is yeah, it, it turns out to be ATR related, but I'm not actually plotting the ATR. The problem with ATR is what what ATR are you actually using? Like how many days? And, and so it gets complex really quick. And then you're kind of on the cusp of using statistics. And I know if I'm eyeballing, I guess I'm using statistics too. But once you start getting into statistical-based stops, then those stops become rather quite large. So there is, there's, still, there's always an element of timing involved with it too. So if you time it properly, your stops can be a little bit tighter uh, than – then if your timing isn't as good and if your market selection isn't as good. So those are important aspects that need to be factored in. And that's the thing about trading. You have to factor in everything, okay? You have to factor in, okay, well, Dave, where should the stop be? Well, the stop should be, I guess it boils down to an ATR. Yes, I, I understand what you're saying. But first of all, did you pick the best stock to begin with? So that stock selection is very important too. Make sure you're in the best markets to begin with and then worry about a stop. And if you are picking better stocks, then you won't get stopped out as much. Those stops will take care of themselves. And like I often say too, once you get better at one thing, then the other two strands of the cord, okay, 
psychology and money management become much easier. Psychologically, it's easier to follow your plan because you're getting either more winners than losers or bigger winners than losers. Okay, that's the most important thing. It doesn't matter if you have a lot of losers as long as your winners are much bigger than your losers. So psychologically, it'll be easy to follow. It'll be easy to follow your plan from a money management standpoint because you're not getting stopped out as much. And then you also recognize if you're catching a few winners here and there, you also recognize like, well, why am I in this losing stock that has hit my stop when I have these nice winners over there? Or I could I could let that stop get hit, free up some capital and go find me some new winning positions. I'll have to tell a story. A broker friend of mine many, many years ago, we were in the midst of this huge great bull market back in 1999. I know I tell the story early, often, so just bear with me. And we had all these stocks I actually wrote about in the first book and all these wonderful stocks that were on both our radar. And I was just buying with both this. And it was great. And I asked him, I was like, you know, what are you buying? Did you buy this? No. Did you buy this? No. I'm like, well, why not? He's like, well, I'm nursing a bunch of positions. And I'm thinking nursing positions. What the heck does that mean? You know, it's like it's, it's almost you could like <laughs> literally think about how do you nurse a position? So instead of margin call, instead of making money, he was not only losing money, but losing more and more money because he wasn't following his plan. How long did it take to determine to take how long did it take you to determine that it was the right strategy for you? Trend following short to medium term framed and technical analysis. Um it probably took a few years, and I think one of the epiphanies that I had was, you know, what, what always gnawed at me, I always made things more and more complex than they had to be. Like I said, the, you know, the wave counting and all of the stupid stuff, okay? It's not stupid if you use it and you're successful. Don't get me wrong. But the misuse of all that, the misuse of any indicators is stupid, Okay. And would always nod at me, no matter how complex I made it, is that all I have to do is sell higher than I buy for longs and obviously cover lower than I shorted for shorts, okay? And all I had to do was just figure out little price movements, okay? So if I could catch a price move from here to here, I made money. If I could catch a price movement from here to here, made money. didn't have to be up. It could be down, okay? And then I used to flip my charts over early in my career quite often. And every now and then I'll flip charts over and I'll put in my column. You know, if we go into another bear market here, I'll flip. I'll wait for a few months until everything's in a really serious downtrend, and I'll flip all the charts upside down and tell everybody how great the charts look. And people get all excited. Oh, those charts do look great. I'm like, those are actually charts that are headed lower. I just flipped them over. Anyway, before I digress too far, it just kept gnawing at me that, well, all I have to do, I know, haha, easy, right, is predict these price movements, okay, or get on these price movements and ride them out. So... How many times I have to tell you I do a webinar every Thursday at 10 o'clock? Anyway, so long story endless, from here to here in a profitable trade is what? A trend. Notice I drew a little arrow. And from here to here in a profitable trade is a trend. So the only way you could ever make money trading an outright market, I know somebody's going to say, but Dave, if you do a reverse iron condor, it's like, no, 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 no. we're not going to get into all those moving parts and all that crazy stuff, okay? We're just talking about trading a market. And even if you are trading all that crazy stuff, you are catching trends within all that crazy stuff, okay? Let's not get too far into that because we'll get the heated debates. But as a general statement, the only way to make money is to capture a market move. I know, duh. Well, if you capture the market move, that is a trend. So no matter what your methodology is, the moment you enter a trade, the moment you enter a trade, you have become a trend follower. So why not follow the trend all the time? That's what I say. So yeah, it took it took a while.
works for your schedule in terms of time commitment anything else okay i presume you have confidence uh confidence in returns work for your schedule in terms of time commitment anything else um well it has to fit your psyche okay um Some people, like some engineering types, tend to – the ones that are successful at trading, a lot of them aren't successful at trading, and I hate to pick on you engineers. I pick on doctors too, anybody who's smart or highly educated, however you want to look at that. Um, anyone like an engineer, sometimes they, they, they refuse to believe that something simple can work and they overcomplicate things, okay? So, but find something that fits fits your psyche. Maybe you are an engineer, and the the little arrows I draw is too simple for you. You feel like you need something more complex, and you can't just follow along. Um, although I think that's probably the best way to trade, right? Because you can't make money unless you catch a trend. But uh, maybe there's something a little bit more complex that you like to do. Maybe one of those aforementioned iron condor crazy things, okay? It's crazy for me. It's been 14, it's been, uh, 14 years in a hedge funds. I just traded options, but um, – and that's probably why I'm not an options trader. <laughs> uh, but, you know, if, if it makes sense to you, then do it. I'm good friends with – you know, here comes a name drop. I'm good friends with Larry McMillan. We, I spent a lot of time with him last week in Vegas or whenever it was. Uh, we went to some show. We went to one show, uh, and we went. To, we ate, and we had some drinks, and you know, talking a lot. Larry's doing things that I probably would not do or could not do. Okay, he's doing some spreads and stuff. He's got a money management firm. It's doing well for him, but he knows what he's doing. He embraces what he's doing. He literally wrote the book on options. Okay, so that's what he does, and he knows he knows the upside, the downside. So you have to find something that works for you. And I think Larry's an ex-engineer, so that that works for him and makes sense for him. I would rather just keep things simpler, okay? Susan says, hey, it's Susan. Susan again. Uh, that's a Susan with the, with the, with the, friendly, with the friendly name, with the uh, familiar name. She says, I'm a CPA, and the hardest to learn was to stop overthinking. Amen. Um you know, and there's a lot of connect the dots with being a CPA. There's some creativity here and there. I realize that. But there's a lot of logic in connecting the dots, okay? And I know, you know, what's the old accountant joke? Uh, you know, yes, accountant, what's one plus what's one plus one equal? And then he pulls the shade down and says, what do you want it to equal? <laughs> you know, so there's a little bit of that creative accounting in that, in, 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 what, they, um, in what they do and, why, and how they earn a living. But as a general statement, it's kind of cut and dry and, you know, debits on the left, credits on the right, right? Okay. And they have to balance out. So, yeah, the smarter you are, the harder trading is for you because you imply logic. You put logic, you try to put a layer of logic. And sometimes there's no logic. The market right now is make, makes no sense, okay? But it could do whatever it wants, so I'm, I'm not going to get excited about it. And if I have to say I'm wrong, I don't care. Learn how to say you're wrong and, and move on, and your life gets a lot easier once again. Extremely overbought or oversold in the short term within a non-trending market. Yep, that's where we are. We're extremely overbought over the short term in a non-trending market. We'll take a look at that, too. Also, traditional, quote, unquote, traditional support resistance levels for stops. Yeah, I mean, that's another thing, too, uh, with the stops. Uh, like I was saying earlier, uh, I did that webinar, uh, or whatever, uh, week of charts, where we talked about stops. And one of the things is, let's say let's say you're trading first pullback after a base breakout. So, so you got a really nice base, and the stock takes off and then pulls back, and you get in right here. Well, if it, you get in and it comes back and hits that base, well, then you're wrong, okay? That what appeared to be a developing trend pfft, is no longer a developing trend. And just like I said earlier, I don't know if I can erase this chart without, yeah, I didn't think I could. Um, but let's say you're trading like a Phoenix pattern where the market bottoms out like this and then makes a little bow tie cup and handle and everything begins to take off and then comes back down and makes new lows. Maybe this longer term downtrend or at or the bottoming pattern is not complete so you have to get out you have to get out of the way you're no longer a trend follower when a new trend begins to develop 
Now the tricky part is when you're trading a pullback and a strong, strong trend and begins to correct. So is this just like an ABC correction? Okay. Or is this the start of something bigger? And you don't know. And you have to have a stop at some point just in case. Why have you not developed systems for non-trending markets? I have developed probably, now keep in mind there's variations in each one, so it's probably not that many. I have probably developed about 3,000 systems in my lifetime, two or 3,000, okay? And a lot of those were contra-trend systems. I just have decided that you're better off trading with the trend. The problem with contra-trend is, you know, at what point, Okay, let's say you're going to sell overbought. Okay, that'd be great. But what's overbought? And doesn't overbought often become more overbought? And the counter trend people tell you, don't use stops. Well, okay. All right, so market's overbought, oversold. Okay, so I'm going to buy it right here. Don't use stops, don't use stops, don't use stops, don't use stops. What are you going to do, you know? So if the only way to make money is to catch a trend, why not be a trend follower all the time? And the other thing to remember, too, is as soon as you start trying to trade that overbought, oversold, or however you want to look at it, a lot of times the market will then begin to trend again. Okay, let's say you're selling over, you know, you buy and sell, buy and sell, buy and sell, buy and sell, whatever, okay? And then you buy it here, and then the market implodes. So you lose this much. And, you know, you chipped away, you chipped away, you chipped away, you chipped away, and then you lose everything, okay? The old eat like a bird and defecate like an elephant comes to play. You're either right or wrong, just follow along. I like that, Howard. Very good. Might have to borrow that from you. Okay, Howard says most of the indices on daily charts have now bow tied up. Yes, but they're not bow tied off of its, its, very, its minor signals. And we'll look at that in just one second. Minor signals. Or so he Howard says there's a bow tie probably in here somewhere. I'm sure there is. Okay. But that's not coming off of like a low, like we saw in 2002, 2003, or a low, like we saw in 2009. Those are just multi month lows. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Jim. I appreciate that. I, I thought we were going to get into a heated debate over uh, over our mean reversion. Jim says, thank you for clearing that up. Even a mean reverter is a mini trend trader. Absolutely. Because if you're trading mean reversion, well, then that, that, that mean better revert. A new trend in the opposite direction better revert really soon or you're going to be in a lot of trouble and lose a lot of money. I probably get more traders from – that come from mean reversion trading than, than all other types of trading combined. Um, I, I probably should seek out the buy and hold people and try to make them convert. I don't, I don't necessarily target anyone. I, I've never really marketed much until uh, in more recent times. I market a little bit here and there. Uh, but just, just out of the blue clients, I probably get more mean reversion clients than anyone else. And uh, they all tell the same story. Yep, I played that game for a while and got burnt. Okay. Not to say that you can't make money. Mean rever I, I heard from a, um, a friend of mine uh, a couple days ago. And uh, I didn't ask him a lot about his trading. I didn't get around to that. Uh, but he's an engineer type, and he, he kind of glommed onto the mean reversion. But he says, Dave, I use stops. And the true mean reversion guys don't use, use stops. Now, you could have a very brief but brilliant career by not using stops and trading mean reversion. You could always you could also have a very brief <laughs> and brilliant, very brilliant but brief career by selling options, okay? Those styles of trading where you have very limited gains and unlimited losses can do quite well for a considerable amount of time. Just make sure you have a chair ready for when the music stops. Mean reversion is counter trend. Well, yeah, it's counter trend, but don't you have to? <laughs> the trend has to turn. You're, you're, you, if the trend doesn't turn, you lose money, right? All right, let's uh, finish up the slides and we'll hop into the um, charts.
you guys want to start asking about individual issues, feel free to do so now. Uh, again, once again, the buy and hope crowd, the buy dips crowd was rewarded. And I put a question mark here, okay? And I'm not going to be obstinate. How'd they say, um, how could you be so obtuse? In, uh, what was that? Shawshank Redemption, you know? <laughs> I'm not going to be obtuse. And I'm not going to be obstinate for the sake of being obstinate. But I'm kind of treating this, this is kind of like a Missouri market. Show me, okay? If this... Uh, Market goes on to make new highs and stays there. I'm all in, okay? Anything less than that, I remain cautious. There's nothing wrong with being cautious and skeptical in the markets. We have stops in place, just in case. Hey, there's another one I need to put out there. Keep a stop in place, just in case. <laughs> uh, consistency is key. Find something to stick with it. Not my way or the highway, Okay. Uh, it, guess what? Sometimes it will be wrong. It's one thing I can guarantee. Longer term, you're going to do just fine, though. Okay? And you won't be emailing me 10 years from now asking me about the latest and greatest system. I'm not saying don't continue your research, but I'm saying maybe just, just find a sect that makes sense to you and stick within that. Okay? For me, it's trend following. And I still look at some other stuff here and there, and I still do a little research. Okay? But it's usually within the, the, the realms of trend following. But... Do what you want. Do what you, makes you happy, what makes you successful, what makes sense to you, but stick with it. I have people, again, I hate to beat the dead horse on this, but have emailed me for 10 and 15 years. And, he, and more recent times, I've actually started cutting people off. I'm like, I'm done. I'm done. You know, it's like you emailed me for 15 years asking me what you should do. And 15 years ago, I said, just, just follow along. It's all you have to do, okay? And then here we are. 15 years later, and they're still asking questions. Had they become a trend follower 15 years ago, then their lives would be a lot different today. So at what point are you going to stop searching? 20 years, 30 years? Okay. We're not on this planet very long. So at some point, you have to find something. I'm not saying it doesn't take a while. It takes a few years. Okay. Uh, read Outliers by Malcolm Gladwell great book um and um i have i haven't read it yet but i, I would have had got it uh talent is i've got a stack of books right here i'm looking at them right now talent is overrated i haven't read it yet but i'm pretty sure it's gonna say a lot of the things that gladwell said um glad you know talent is made not born okay we're not born traders um you know as i said before my my daughter is a horrible singer or was a horrible singer uh, she was singing in the shower once and I was outside. I ran in the house. I thought she was being tortured, right? But she now she has a really good voice and she's actually done a few, I wouldn't call them gigs, but she's done quite a few public performances. So she's developed that though. She's worked her butt off to become that way. She did, you know, she got a guitar at six years old. She did, she wasn't that good at first, okay? But she stuck with it. And when she was in, uh, I think, sixth grade, she did uh, Jimi Hendrix, Star Spangled Banner. Um, as influenced by a father in outliers he talks about he talked about the beatles well the beatles became great now their head they might have had a little uh inner talent or a little talent but that talent was developed because they used to play in nightclubs where they they didn't up playing all night and they'd run out of songs to play so they'd start playing classical music uh you ever notice a beatles song sometimes in the middle of beatles song is like a new pop pop you know it's like what the heck you know but they became good because they worked at it. So you're going to have to work at it. And that's, it's like, again, you know, you can't make $10 million in 10 minutes a day in spite of what the emails say. Okay. Hey, I'll write that down too. Uh, patience is the other secret, you know, uh, three months for three months. We only ended up with about three trades and it's kind of hard, you know, cause trading is an active verb. You want to just jump right in there and try to make as much money as fast as you can. But I think if there is any secret to trading, it's patience. It's waiting on the markets to come to you, waiting for the entries, waiting for the position to either work or stop you out, okay? <laughs> There's a lot of waiting if you're going to do trading. There's another one. All right. Art says, back in the 70s, Stan Weinstein used – that's a good uh, That's a good book, too. Uh, Stan Weinstein, I didn't find it until late in my career. Uh, Stan Weinstein used to use a 10-week moving average across the 30-week moving average, 50-day crossing the 150-day. After a stage four decline followed by a nice base, a Phoenix stock, it was a nice successful setup to trade. 
Yeah, you know, uh, he's quantified something that I guess I've kind of quantified it too. I said, okay, you need, need a nice long base, and then you need a something like a bow tie coming out of that base. Well, I, you know, I just showed you the bow ties and how great they work, but just if you follow the slope of a 50-week moving average, and if that's all you did, you would probably do okay. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say do it mechanically. But if that slope of that 50-week moving average, which would be what, 50 times 5, 250-day moving average, I guess, on a daily chart, 50 period uh, on a weekly chart, the 50-week moving average, okay? If all you did was follow the slope of that 50-week moving average, and not necessarily traded mechanically, but if it was headed higher, you were mostly long, and if it was headed lower, you were mostly short, you would probably do okay. So that's where a lot of technicals come together. I'm this huge fan of my bow tie pattern, but a lot of other type of patterns are going to set up just as a bow tie will. So look at this 50-week moving average. What do we have here? Positive slope. Positive slope, positive slope, positive slope, positive slope, positive slope, positive slope. Uh, it slowed down a little bit here, but I think it stayed positive. Look at that, okay? From there to there. So from 1995... To 1999, you had a weekly positive slope in the 50-day moving average. Write that down. From 2000 to 2003, you had a negative slope in the 50-week moving average. From 2003 to 2007, what did you have? A positive slope in the 50-week moving average. 2008. To 2009, what did you have? A negative slope at a 50-week moving average. You kind of get the idea here, huh? And then the last run we had higher, we had what? A positive slope at a 50-week moving average. What do we have now? Well, I think it's a little negative. We'll take a look at it in a minute. It might be kind of blipping up again in here now. But as you can see, it usually pays attention to follow along. Weinstein gives structure to the market. Great book. Yeah. Um, I have to find my copy. <laughs> they, my books end up all over my office. And, and then whenever we get company coming, my wife cleans up and then they all get picked back up and I got to find them again. No. Well, the question is, was I, was I stopped out of USO? No. We'll take a look at that. I think the stop was 13 on that. Okay, uh, I think that's good. Let's uh, let's hop into the markets. I just want to take a look at the overall market real quick. Oh, by the way, I started podcasting. Um, sometimes I get a little long-winded, obviously, in my columns. And um, I know some of you guys are doing things you shouldn't be doing. Like I shouldn't say this, but you're watching these shows on your on your while you're driving on your. Um, <laughs> on your iPhones, please stop doing that. Uh, so just, uh, you know, put the podcast on. The audio should be okay. Like Greg usually says, don't operate heavy machinery afterwards, but don't operate heavy machinery while. But, uh, yeah, check out the podcast on my website. And actually, uh, since the website is up here, just go right here. And usually the column, I put it right here. And then if not, just scroll down the sidebar, and it's right here too. All right, let's hop into the – Charts. Oh, I did. I said I promised something with the stock selection uh, webinar uh, with course. I make you a deal. If um, this is going to be an unadvertised deal, if you buy the stock selection course right here, how to pick the best stocks, I'll give you a, a year free to my trading service. So I show you how to pick stocks. OK, I like to do that in theory, but I also like to do that in practice thing. And then you could watch me pick stocks for a whole year and compare your notes to mine. So. I think that's one way, I, you know, I don't want to brag too much, but I think that's one way to shorten the learning curve uh, is to first take the course and then second, watch everything for about a year and be serious about it for a whole year. And I think you'll have a pretty good idea of how markets work and how trend following works. All right, let's take a look at the P's and let's take a look at a couple of these sectors in here that I'll be happy to jump out to those individual stocks, which is my favorite part of the show. I like talking about your stuff. Um, look at the P's. Pretty good run in here, okay? So far, so good. Again, not to beat the dead horse, we've worked our way into overhead supply. Also, 
as I say, ad nauseum, very hard to mount a leg on top of another leg. Stranger things have happened, but you're much, you're much better off in a market that makes a nice long base or a nice long bottom, like, like 2002, 2003. That market took two years to consolidate and bottom out. And then what happened afterwards? We had a great run afterwards. These V-shaped recoveries at high levels, just not a big fan of that pattern. But again, the market could do whatever it wants. Now, Howard or someone was saying we got a bow tie on the daily. Well, let's take a look at that. Uh, yeah, we got a bow tie in here, okay? And then it's already triggered and the market's headed higher. But I'm not as excited about a bow tie at these high levels as I would be at a bow tie at a much longer level, lower level. It kind of comes back to that the Phoenix thing, okay? 2009, I mean, look at the bow tie back here on the daily chart. That's a legit signal because you're coming off of 15 years lows, okay? I'm not too excited. Look at this bow tie up here. I'm not too excited about a multi-month or even one or two year bow tie where the market's rolling over from high levels. This doesn't excite me, okay? This, eh, or as my daughter says, eh. This, mmm, that looks pretty good when you get a bow tie from major, major levels. This is why I'm so concerned about this market because we had a daily and a weekly bow tie, as I beat the dead horse on a minute ago, off on the S&P 500, off of all-time highs. That is very significant. NASDAQ. NASDAQ has plowed through its overhead supply like butter so far. But again, here's another market where it's going to be hard for this market to mount a new leg on top of an old leg. Let's measure this run. Eyeball, it looks like about 500 points. What's that, about 10%? Let's measure to yesterday's about 12%. Look at that, 13%. Okay. 13% in about a month. Mm, that's pretty hard to sustain, right? That's what, about 150% a year, round numbers? Give or take a little? I don't know. Somebody wanted to look at the dollar earlier. Let's do that before I forget. Dollar is uh, stalling out a little in here today, but uh, I think the trend there for now is sideways. Longer term, it might be in trouble. Let's take a look at a weekly bow tie here. You had a daily bow tie back here. By the way, when you get a daily bow tie or a weekly bow tie or any bow tie, off of major, major highs, that top remains in place until those highs are taken out. Write that down. Okay? 2,000. Here we go, beat a dead horse. 2,000. Okay? Until that top got taken out, 2,000, a top remained in place, right? And then that lasted all the way until when? 2002, 2003, when the market bottomed out. So... Unless you get a major signal off of multi-multi-year lows, 10-year lows, 15-year lows, all-time lows, then that top remains in place. So especially in the early phases like this. So let's take a look at the weekly. We don't have a weekly. That's interesting. Look at that. Uh, there's not even a weekly bow tie yet. And I don't know if yet's going to be the keyword in that sentence in the dollar. That's fascinating. You would think that given this pattern here, you'd have a weekly bow tie down, but not yet. Okay. And, you know, look at the outside. Look how beautiful this bow tie is. Look at that. You're coming off of multi-year lows, okay? So I'm more impressed with this bow tie than I am with this one right here, the dollar. So, yeah, shorter term, trend is up at a dollar. Intermediate term, sideways. Longer term, I think it's in, still in trouble. Looks like it's still rolling over, okay? Andre, I appreciate you waiting patiently. We're going to get to all those stocks in just one second. Uh, let's take a look at gold and, and finish up the commodities. Um, Gold, the commodity itself, to me, looks like it's bottoming out in here. But, yes, it's a bit of an electric cardiogram. It's kind of all over the place, as commodities can sometimes be. But I do think it's bottoming. The gold stocks are a little bit cleaner. The gold stocks are going to have a little overhead supply and a little overhead resistance to deal with. But I am a bull here. And so far, we got a little bow tie. But it's kind of taking its, old, its own sweet time to get going. You could also see a little cup and handle. So, as I said, the teaser for the webinar uh, where I think the next trends could be, I think gold could be our next trends, and I think metals and mining. I know I've been preaching that for a while, 
But unfortunately, these bottoms here have turned from kind of a process to an event and then now back to a process. Energies are the same way, okay? And you can see 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, about 20 days, okay, the pullback. So I'm not seeing a whole lot of setups. That can be frustrating to say, okay, this market looks like it's bottom, but I'm not really getting setups. So that's a database telling you, hey, eh, hold off a little bit, maybe not yet. So I'm a bull on the energies. I'm a bull on the metals and mining, but I haven't taken a lot of action there. Or I should say that the setups that I have gone after have it triggered, so I don't have a lot of positions working there. Somebody mentioned USO. We had a stop at USO at 13. Okay, so far we haven't been stopped out. But this, okay, and then you got to ask yourself, would you take the trade again? On every trade, you, didn't, you need to do a post-mortem. And if you take a look at the energies, if you go back to when we got the setup, when we had the setup, look how beautiful that is. You're making these major, major lows, and then you start zooming off those lows, okay? All the shorts are getting squeezed. That looked like a bottom. A little, little iffy. Remember, whenever you're trading a transitional pattern, you are a bit of a pioneer, and you're either going to get the gold or you're going to get arrows in your back. But the chance of the gold makes it all worthwhile as I often preach, okay? And so far, it looks like they're kind of bottoming out. Now, with transitional patterns, again, sometimes you're ripe it early, and that's okay. Several other commodities look like they're bottoming. Sugar, so yeah, it, they, they usually, quite often, they all go together, S-O-Y-B. Yeah, I would say bottoming, but uh, the Jaren being the... Um, the word net sentence or bottomings in Jaren, right? Then the Jaren have ING after I learned in my Italy lessons, my Italian lessons, Italiano lessons. Uh, kind of sideways in here. I hear you. It's bottoming. What's the other one you said? SGG is sugar? <laughs> I remember in 1999, I said, you know, somebody needs to make ETFs for all these commodities. <laughs> You ever have a good idea, then see it come to fruition without you on board? <laughs> that would be one of them. Yeah, sugar looks pretty good. Um, let's put a bow tie in there. Oh, look at that. You got a bow tie. Let's say put a weekly bow tie. Not quite a weekly, but, boy, that looks like the mother of all bottoms. So, yeah, Phil, good eye on the sugar. I ain't taking no, less, no English lessons from a Cajun. <laughs> yeah, some people say, Dave, I, I didn't realize you're Cajun. You don't sound it. It's like... You ever heard me sometimes in a webinar? Oh, man, that market looked bad. <laughs> it slips out every now and then. Karen says, Shaq. Okay, if you don't mind, one ticket at a time. Well, I tell you, you have a you have a, um, a public phone number. <laughs> every broker in the world calls you every day. Yeah, if you do... Call me, and it goes to voicemail. Just leave me a message. I'll, they, they did shoot me an email. Hey, Dave, left you a message. I'll be happy to call you back, or I'll look for you in a caller ID. I have been long from the bottom and sugar. Good for you. And they go to the next line. <laughs> How many times do I have to tell you? They're calling both lines. That's interesting. All right, MSL, KFS, MSL. Uh, uh, that looks like a downtrend. It's also super thin. Look how thin this stock is. So, uh, no, as a trend follower, that does not look like a trend you want to be following, unless you're short. Um, MU. Yeah, MU looks like it's bottoming out. Uh, let's back the chart way out, see what we got going on. Um, it's multi-year lows. Ideally, I like to see it, like, way back here, what is, like, what was that? Five year lows, 10 year lows, serious lows. Um, but yeah, shorter term, it looks okay. But unfortunately, you can see it kind of sold off really hard. It's coming back down. And notice how it went one, two, three, four, five, six. It went about two weeks and then it began to drop. So I think it's bottoming, but I don't think it's done yet. You've got uh, a head and shoulders bottom, you got a bow tie, but then now it's kind of rolling back over. So I would avoid this one for now. Uh, let it go back to bottoming. The other thing, too, and I know it would be a good problem to have, you do have some resistance here. 
but I guess that's far enough away if you went long. But uh, for now, I think it's more of a process than an event. Now, keep in mind that Micron is a huge – how does uh, Donald Trump say it? It's huge, huge. It's a huge stock, okay? Uh, I can even say it right now. Uh, trades uh, 315 bazillion shares every day. So I prefer to find something a little bit less efficient, maybe a little bit smaller cap stock. Uh, sometimes these bigger cap stocks, as I said earlier with the Gogo Nomo uh, thing, can be a, um, a good pat a good pattern to trade. See, there's somebody giving me information. Karen, don't tell me this. It's a Shack reports November fifth. Okay, reports what? That was a joke. Um, it's bottoming out. I mean, you know, we could have a a Phoenix type of stock shaping up here. Although it could work, as you can see, you had a nice, you know, what's what, what, what pattern did I just talk about a little while ago? First pullback after base breakout. There's your base. There's your first pullback, and then it had a nice little run afterwards, and then, of course, began to implode from there. But you had a nice little tradable setup back here and it took off nicely for a little while at least, and then it came back in. I just have a hard time getting excited about restaurants, especially like IPOs, like a – an IPO seems like they need to be more of a, um, something exciting, but it could also be a fad like uh, like Lulamon. I didn't, um, or was, I think my daughter calls it Lemonhead or something. Lemon, Lemonmon, Lemonmon sounds like a Jamaican. Um, I missed the mother of all trades in Lulamon because I made fun of the company because they sell yoga clothes. Well, what I failed to realize at the time was a fad is a fad, and markets could take off on a fad. So it doesn't matter why. It's going up or what they do. So, but yeah, I, with that said, I have a hard time getting excited about restaurants. But I would leave this one alone for now until you see it uh, bow tie. You know, the fact that they have earnings, eh, doesn't matter. Do you do flags? I mean, it looks like a bear flag. Um, well, I wouldn't call it a bear flag because it's already at lower levels. I see a bear flag as, as at higher levels. Uh, I do a little bit of everything when it comes to classical technical analysis. A couple patterns I'm not big fans of. But uh, there's things that I don't necessarily act on, but I observe, okay? And, uh, for instance, a flag, if I see something like um, – sometimes you get like a little flag in the market, a little gradual pullback. And uh, that that I see is kind of bullish, and then you get just the opposite – where a market kind of drifts up like this, I call that a wedge. Wedge is up a little bit. I actually see this as kind of bearish, okay? And that's just classical technical analysis. So, yeah, I use a little bit of everything, and I frame it within um, my pattern. You would short shack, okay? Um, I wouldn't short it because you're down here towards these lows. Um, I wouldn't get that excited about that. Uh, you know, this is what I want a short to look like or something rolling over from high levels, kind of nice and gradual. Not necessarily a, a stock that's kind of scraping bottom in here, okay? I mean, you're probably right. It probably is uh, headed lower, but I'd leave it alone. Hasbro has a, is a ticker. Uh, Hasbro? We'll take a look at that. Um, well, you know, here's the thing that just jumps out at me. Never forget about net net change. You know, where is it now? 75 round numbers. Where was it back last April? 75 round numbers with some zigs and zags in between. Um there's nothing tradable there. It's kind of electrocardiogram, so I would, I would leave that one alone. What is too small a volume? Depends. Okay, as a private trader, you could sometimes dip below a hundred thousand shares on average. Okay, my scans are set to two hundred fifty thousand. In IPOs, I tend to trade a little bit thinner IPOs, or I tend to let the uh, setups or use uh, take setups that are a little bit thinner in IPOs. Um, because IPOs sometimes have uh, what I call like a hidden volume. Volume could, would sometimes flow into an IPO as it is discovered. With the more established stocks, I personally want to see at least 100,000 or more. Uh, usually anything I recommend, unless I really can't find a setup in my trading service, my core trading service is right around 250,000 shares or more on a – I always forget it. I don't know if it's a 30-day average or 50-day average. Usually the one, it doesn't really matter. There's not much difference between those two. Um, so, but anything that drops below 100,000 shares on average for an established issue, I think it's a little dangerous to trade. Like 
I don't remember which stock it was a little while ago, but you go in and trade a thousand shares, and it's only trading several thousand shares a day, then um, you could have a hard time getting in and out of stock. Your own trading may push it around. GG on sell-off today. GG is going to be a gold stock. Yeah, I like it. Uh, that looks pretty good. Uh, but, you know, it's kind of imploding a little bit in here. But you've got a nice little bow tie. you got a nice little bottom in here. Phil usually has a pretty good eye on these things. Uh, but now the, there's a big question mark. It looks like it's going back to challenge its old lows. So I would leave that alone. You know, unless it had the mother of all rallies and took out today's high, by the end of the day, I would I would go ahead and leave that one alone. But, yes, this is a great example of a stock that looks like it's bottoming out. But, again, it looks like it's going back to a process. B's and already triggered, working through ST overhead. I was in after the bow tie. All right, let's take a look at that for Craig. Yeah, that looks pretty interesting. You got the bow tie here. You got a tiny little pullback. Uh, yeah, sometimes these, ISP, these IPOs could work through the overhead supply a little bit better than a more established issue because I think in an IPO, you got people that are from day one are looking to get off the hook. And I think that that selling works its way through the system quickly. Not enough time to get into all that today, but uh, if only there were a course on how to trade IPOs. All right, Don wants to know about fold. You put an old at the, at the end of the Ford. Uh, no, it's already broken down, um, but you can see it did have a nice bow tie before it began to implode in here. But no, that's already, um, you know, the bomb's already exploded there. I don't see any reason to go after that as a short. I mean, I hear you, though. It looks like it's in trouble. UNP looking iffy. Yeah, UNP would be one of those uh, aforementioned um, Go Go Nomo stocks. Ideally, you want to catch these like right there. See that bow tie off of all-time highs? There's your double top. Okay, that's a little bit more of a go-go no more way back here. Okay. Um, but it still looks iffy. The downtrend's still intact. Like I said, this this top here is still intact, okay, until proven otherwise. Uh, but it's kind of worked its way higher as of late, so I would leave that one alone as a possible short. Can we get the chart template? Absolutely. Uh, for the stock shown well it's just all I'm doing is um, I'm just adding some some indicators in here I could show you how to add them I could also give you my scans if you want them no problem yeah Phil I did the he says the audio goes in and out that's because a squirrel could could have uh, gotten his nuts caught between some wires in between me and you CRWN for Andre CRWN David wants to look at MGM you're next uh, the stock's certainly in an uptrend. It's kind of a choppy uptrend, but yeah, on a pullback, that might be worthwhile. Sure. Susan wants to look at NIM. Susan, you going to dream about me? <laughs> That's a little inside joke for <laughs> last week. I told Susan her name sounded familiar, and I asked her if I knew her, and she said, in my dreams. Yeah, this looks good. This is already kind of triggered from a bow tie in here back here, um, so I would wait for the next pullback, but yeah, it looks fantastic. If you long, stay long. It looks pretty good every night. Thank you, Susan. I appreciate that. You're so sweet. NASDAQ gap could measure 50% of move of another 50. I don't know what that. Yeah, I don't use that. You know, measured move. Eh, be careful with that kind of stuff. It's dangerous. But if you use it, use it. I'm just not a fan. I know it's not a buy yet, but could you draw on the chart how it must perform before you would buy VUZI or VUZX? Oh, VIZX, okay. V U Z I. Uh, well, it would have to, unfortunately, in this particular case, and this is, you know, the methodology is not a be all end all, okay? Sometimes you just have to wait, like I said earlier. It would actually have to take out all of this overhead supply before we get excited about this particular stock. And you can see that the, um, the volume. Is, uh, is slightly on the low side. It's about 100,000 shares on average. You can still trade as a private trader, but it is a little thin. And it's kind of a little wide and loose and choppy. So wait for it to take out the top of that range before getting too excited, at least following my methodology. EDUC, is that going to be an educational stock? I hate educational stocks. Yep, it's educational stock. Uh, super, super, super thin. 26,000 on average shares traded, 44,000 today. Uh, so is that right? No, 4,400 traded today. So if you go in and trade 1,000 shares, you are 25% of today's volume. I hear you, though. It's working its way higher. 
on a pullback, yes, but uh, very thin and dangerous. LVS for Miss Susan. Uh, too much overhead supply, okay? It's like the brothel. Uh, they put um, the brothel on top of the uh, hardware store. The hardware store didn't make it because, oh, wait a minute, it's PG-13. I can't tell that joke. Uh, no, see, anyone who bought in this range is likely going to look to get out of break even. But if it got above this range, uh, yeah, all bets are off. Maybe it'll work. CCJ for Mr. Phil. CCJ is going to be a uranium stock. Uh, these uranium stocks, I kind of have a love-hate relationship with them, as a friend of mine used to joke. Uh, you love them, they hate your account. Uh, you do have a bow tie here. It does have a lot of wide and loose trading, so I think I would pass on that one, at least for now. Andre wants to know about ABXL. ABXL. Uh, interesting. Let's take a look. It's had a pretty serious run. It's up a thousand percent over a fairly short period of time. Uh, I think I would pass on it because not that it can't go up another thousand percent, but look at your HV historical volatility is at 136. That's pretty high. It's kind of like you've already had that expansion in volatility. Um, we're, we're almost out of time, but remember where, when I did the chart where I showed that if you're trend trading correctly, you capture not only expansion, in the price or favorable price movement, I should say, but you also capture acceleration, capture acceleration, you tried to say, and then an expansion and volatility on top of that, okay? Katos, I am long. Katos. Uh, yeah, it's okay. A uh, lot of, lot of overhead supply. I guess it'd be a good problem to have. That's 25% away. Um, but I hear you, you've got a nice little bow tie, you got a nice little pullback, it's kind of taken off out of that. But I personally would go after because of the overhead supply, but hey, if you're long, stay long, as long as you have a stop in place. Jim wants to know about INTC, INTC. Now Intel's very thick stock, okay? Look at the volume in this, another uh, 50 bazillion, 35 bazillion million shares. So that's the only thing that I'm not a big fan of. Uh, it has worked its way higher, it looks like it's in an uptrend. But I think I would pass just because it's kind of longer term. It's all over the place. It's a very thick stock. I think you could find something out there. Looks a little better. Adobe's going to be another one. Same same sort of issue, more than likely. Um, you know, it's it just it works its way higher, but it's just choppy and all over the place. Okay. Um, I mean, I hate to say it, this actually looks like a long term type of holding type position, right? Um, but notice that it just barely got past its prior highs in here. So there's not a whole lot of acceleration there. Again, what was the one uh, from last week? AP, you know, this is what you want to look for. You want to look for a stock that takes off and then pulls back and then obviously takes off again. And now this is why you need to stop. Look at that. <laughs> but you can see nice move up and then it, it imploded from there. And that's why you use stops in your trading and take partial profits. People are like, why do you take partial profits? Okay, there you go right there, that's why. All right, one or two more, I'm gonna wrap things up. Uh, yeah, I hear you, this is breaking out, but let's look at this longer term. It's kind of wide loose and all over the place. If it kept breaking out, maybe on a pullback, but it's kind of all over the place. Uh, you know, I, I'm sorry I wasn't able to get to, um, how do you decide on weekly or daily bow tie? Thanks. Well, always look at your dailies first, and then use for your, use your weekly for confirmation. If you sit around and wait for a weekly bow tie, you might be waiting for a long, 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 long time. But if one occurs, okay, then you need to pay attention to that signal, okay? I know some people that that they, they apply the Phoenix strategy to stocks, and you might want to write this down. I'll give you a little something to take home today. Uh, they apply the Phoenix strategy to stocks on a weekly basis using bow ties, okay? And they catch some really nice bottoms every now and then, okay? Uh, but I personally go after them when they're making daily bow ties because that move might be so big and so fast that that longer term weekly moving average is going to take too long to catch up. But once they occur, pay attention to them. Like I wouldn't sit around the S&P 500 and say, well, it's down 30 percent, but uh, we don't have a weekly bow tie. So it's not a sell. It's like, no, you sell first once you get stopped out or once you get some sort of shorter term signal. And then ask questions later, but like in the S&P 500 now, now we've got this weekly bow tie beginning to roll over in here, which it may not work. Obviously, the market can go on and make new highs. But if it it does continue to roll over, then I think you need to pay attention to that signal. Um, I appreciate uh, 
you guys and girls coming here today. Um, I'm, I'm looks like we're getting more women in here. That's that's kind of exciting. Uh, you women are actually better traders than most of the, us guys because our ego gets in our way, whereas you guys do what has to be done. And we've talked about that in prior sessions, too. So I'm glad to see more women uh, coming to the shows. Uh, but, uh, you know, you guys, I'm glad to see you, too. Obviously, my uh, my old friends here. Uh, I have a blast doing these, as you can tell. So I appreciate you guys coming and girls. And as long as you guys continue to show up, obviously, I'll continue to do them. Uh, everybody have a great week. And if we don't talk again, anything unanswered. I answer all my emails, and I guess eventually, eventually is a caveat there. If you're on the service, obviously, I give you press, precedent. And you can also call me, too, if you need to uh, talk to me. 985-898-4993 uh, is the number. As you can hear, it rings right to my desk. Anyway, everybody have a great weekend if we'll talk again, again. And then uh, hope to see all you guys and girls again next week. Thank you so much. Happy Halloween. <laughs> yeah, happy Halloween. You too, Karen.